achieving a safe, just, and secure ocean protects the well-being of all people, communities, and economies. We need collaborative efforts and partnerships to ensure sustainable resource management, uphold maritime safety and security, and respect international norms on the high seas. Safeguarding our ocean is a shared responsibility, and all nations must act responsibly to share information, implement internationally agreed safety and security standards for their fleets, and take effective enforcement actions. Please welcome back the Honorable Monica Medina. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back. I just want to give a quick shout out to all the chefs. I have never been at a conference with so much delicious and nutritious food, so thank you all those who helped prepare it. At this point, we're going to turn our attention to maritime security and the importance of achieving a safe, just, and secure ocean. Sadly, we know for a fact that there just is way too much lawless and inhumane behavior happening out in the oceans. And we have to factor these bad actors into the system and have to take action uh, to run counter to what's happening out there. Luckily, we have a great panel here to talk about that. And here to lead us through it uh, on a discussion on what can be done is Masanori Kobayashi, a senior research fellow at the Ocean Policy Research Institute. So please, welcome, welcome, uh, join me in welcoming Mr. Kobayashi to the stage. Thank you very much. Hello, Ali. Good afternoon, uh, bon après-midi, and konnichiwa. I'm Masanori Kobayashi, a senior research fellow of the Ocean Policy Research Institute of the Sasekawa Peace Foundation. The Nippon Foundation and the Sasekawa Peace Foundation have been supporting the government of Palau to prepare for the, our ocean conference to achieve a sustainable ocean. I'm very honored to be on this stage to moderate a session achieving a sustainable, a safe, and a just, and a secure ocean with five distinguished panelists. I now like to invite uh, five distinguished panelists. First, let me invite uh, Rear Admiral Matthew W. Sibre, Commander 14th Coast Guard District, U.S. Coast followed by Captain Roy Dumas, Strategy, Force Planning and Decision Making Maritime Safety and Security Expert of Gabon. Uh, then Dr. Manmatabi Tapurusen, Director General, Pacific Island Forum Fishery Agency. The Honorable John M. Silk, Minister of Natural Resources and Commerce, Republic of the Marshall Island. And Mr. David Wilma, Research Officer, Institute for Security Studies. Uh, please welcome the five panelists. At the outset, I just wanted to mention that uh, um, this ocean, um, this is a very, very special. When I was a child, um, I was born and raised in the uh, landlocked uh, prefecture called Tochigi, Japan. And the uh, ocean was very special as I went to the ocean once in the summer, my family trip. And my father used to teach me how to count the time to jump and cross the waves and also dive in the water when a big wave crashes in front of me. The ocean, therefore, is the place for joy to me, 
the ocean is also a place for living and a source of food and income to sustain livelihood. Uh, the ocean, however, turns to be a place for exploitation and misery for some people, as President Whips and the Presidential Special Envoy Kerry emphasized yesterday, that one of the growing challenge uh, to sustainable ocean and maritime security is IUU fishing, illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing. FAO and High Level Panel for Sustainable Ocean Economy estimate to 10 to 23 billion US dollars is lost due to IUU fishing, accounting for 11 to 26 million tons of fish, or about 20% of world fish catch. IUU fishing not only depletes fish stock and undermines sustainable fish stock management, but IUU fishing also harbors criminal activities, such as kidnapping, human trafficking, forced labor, murder, bribery, and uh, drug dealing. Port State Measures Agreement, PSMA, is a principal international legal instrument to eliminate IUU fishing, where port authorities deny entry of IUU fishing vessels. Regional Fishery Management Organization, RFMO, provides IUU fishing vessel list. 70 countries are the party to PNMS. However, some major fishing and seafood importing countries haven't yet become the party to the PNMS. The Fishing Labor Convention of ILO, adopted 15 years ago, has only 20 countries as a party to the convention. Monitoring, control, and surveillance of ocean activities and law enforcement are indispensable. The Nippon Foundation and the South Africa Peace Foundation, uh, together with Australia, USA, and Taiwan, support Palau to deploy maritime surveillance vessels and strengthen its maritime surveillance capability. Satellite technology are also applied and aerial monitoring is also conducted. Pacific Island Forum Fishery Agency provides collective monitoring operation for the Pacific countries. How can we improve the effectiveness of our efforts to ensure that our ocean will be safe, just, and secure for all the countries and the people? How are the what are the challenges to promote national policy, um, the regional cooperation, and international partnership? Let's listen to the five distinguished panelists on their experiences and um, perspectives. So at the outset, I'd like to invite uh, Rear Admiral Matthew Silvey, Commander 14th Coast Guard District of the U.S. Coast Guard, to take the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Ali, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for uh, providing me the honor to be up here and, and talk a little bit about how the United States Coast Guard is operationalizing a lot of what we have talked about uh, so far during this just fantastic conference in the beautiful island nation of Palau. So the United States Coast Guard is a global Coast Guard. We operate around the world, and as we've recapitalized our assets, we've also enhanced our capabilities and our ability to get to some parts of the region that we have not been able to get to in the past on a more consistent uh, pro, uh, timeline. You know, as we look up here at this, uh, at this chart that kind of shows a little bit of, uh, of the region and our area of responsibility, the one thing that, you know, all those boundary lines, all those distances are great, uh, but the fish apparently don't recognize those boundary lines at all. Um, you know, IUU fishing is, as we've talked about, a global challenge. And when we look at it from a Coast Guard perspective, the fisheries part is, a, is, a, is the problem, but there are other act, bad actors out there doing bad things that all come together out on the seas. You know, we've talked about how global fish stocks are under stress from climate change and exploitation. You know, combating this uh, IUU fishing uh, is truly, uh, a, you know, an issue that we have to deal with. It costs us tens of billions of dollars a year We've talked about how many the major fish stocks are exploited, overexploited, or significantly depleted. We recognize this in the Coast Guard, and about a year and a half ago, our commandant signed the IUU fishing strategic context for the Coast Guard because we realize that this is an area that really fits into what we do and something that we have been doing for decades. Uh, with that, we came out with an implementation plan. 
And that implementation plan has three lines of effort. One is to promote targeted, effective, intelligence-driven enforcement operations. The second is to count counter predatory and irresponsible state behavior. And third is to expand multilateral fisheries enforcement cooperation. As we work through these things, we need to mobilize tools in new ways, force multiplying our approach. We've had a lot of discussions about data and what we have, what we need to have, but we also need to figure out what we can learn from that. And what we're working on with our partners is taking that data and figuring out where are the most, where's the most risk and where can we put our, our cutters out there. We have developed in the Coast Guard what we call Operation Blue Pacific. It is a whole of Coast Guard look at this region on an annual basis of what we want to try and accomplish, where we want to send our cutters, our aircraft, our training teams, uh, our folks to engage with the communities. The one thing that's most important is when we're working on developing this is that we talk to the other nations of the region because we truly understand it's not what we want to do, it's what those, our Pacific Island countries want us to do and how we can, can help. I think one of the best ways that has worked for us is that we understand when some of their assets are going through maintenance or they're not available. And we can re-wreck some of our patrol boats or our fast response cutters to go down and patrol in their EEZs and in their waters so that we can work on that maritime do domain awareness approach of what we do. You know, this is, IUU fishing's one dimension in what we do in maritime security. So when we're out operating on a, an IUU fisheries uh, patrol, we're also looking at what else is out there. Some of our traditional security threats, human and drug trafficking, uh, et cetera. So as we look at it, we talk a little bit about regional capacity building. You know, our goal, uh, like many others, is a, for a free and open Indo-Pacific governed by a rules-based order. You know, that's where we're, tar we're looking. We're looking at targeted, effective, intelligence-based, intelligence-driven enforcement operations as we work in collaboration with, the other, with our other partners. Up here you'll see we currently have 11 bilateral law enforcement uh, agreements uh, in the region with two more that we're working on and, and hope to uh, bring to conclusion here in the near future. These multilateral and bilateral partnerships, whether it's with our, our ship rider uh, uh, countries or it's with working with uh, folks like the WCPFC or the FFA in figuring out where we want to work and how we want to work. These, uh, these agreements help us because we can take members from that country if we're like, for example, next week we're going to conduct a bilateral shiprider agreement uh, operation here off of Palau. We're going to take some Palau folks on board. We're going to conduct law enforcement operations in Palau's EEZ and enforce their laws upon their waters with their people on board our ships. That is a, is a model that we're working on that has really helped us get after it and help us uh, tackle IUU fishing. Thank you. Thank you, um, Rear Admiral uh, Sibley, for your uh, presentations. Uh, I really understand that uh, quite complex the regional corporations for enhancing maritime security really require the consistent uh, efforts. I thank you indeed for your presentations. May I now turn to Captain uh, Maduma, Rick Maduma. Um, he has been working on the maritime security for Gulf of Guinea. Uh, please welcome uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Captain Maduma. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm from Gabon. I want to share a proverb with you, the proverb you use in Gabon. In Gabon, we say, your stomach, your, your, your belly, is your first enemy. Because he's the one who's telling you in the morning, please wake up, I want something into my belly. And the thing is that your belly doesn't know what to put inside. Sometimes it could be an illegal caught fish. Sometimes it could be a legal caught because you don't know where the fish is coming from. You can open a can, you don't know where it has been done. So all of us, some probably you have been eating some 
illegal fish. Don't care about that. There is no law enforcement that. So countries have been struggling with that issue within the Gulf of Guinea. Like my country, Gabon, we have dedicated 23% of all our uh, uh, EZZ for made some uh, marine protected area. But the challenge we are facing is we have the maritime governance issue, we have the funding for implementing strategies, the technology is very expensive, and the lack of common worldwide approach as a consensus to sort out the issue. So I'm here to share only how MDAs and NGOs can help to solve the problem. The NGOs can work as an energy boost because having a motivated non-state partner can help to motivate navies and coast guard to go beyond their comfort zone and do more for security and law enforcement when they work as a team. The credibility boost. Having a credible international entity supporting the Navy or Coast Guard can help overcome some of the lack of political will that will prevent dealing with maritime crime. Sometimes NGOs can more easily mobilize funds to provide the logistic support. We also have the scientific, the scientific boost. Working with NGOs can, can, bro can bring scientists with us to work in order to have a better data. Also the transparency boost. Working with, the, with, working with NGOs is very good because they are transparent and they can prevail people to go in corruption. And about MDA, the MDA is very important because we cannot work without uh, a very good, uh, we cannot work without a very good maritime picture. The maritime picture is very important to conduct very good operation and to share with countries boarding yours. And it's very important also to share information because all is about sharing information, the right information at the right time. The MDAs, we have been helpful. They have been very helpful with us to predict the piracy attacks when it was to deal about piracy. And the oil industry also, they have, oil, they are, uh, they have uh, radars on the oil platform. They should share this kind of information with us. The dark ship at sea also about the transshipment of oil, uh, oil products that is very, very dangerous for pollution is also important in terms of MDA sharing. The MDA should play a very, very good role for IUU fishing because through the traceability and trading system, as the Admiral said, we can now identify where the illegal fishing boats are operating and where the product is landing at because all is about who is doing what and where is it selling what he has been caught, uh, catching illegally somewhere. So we can also establish a very, very good port set measurements, agreements tool to provide traceability because as he said, there is no border at the sea. So a ship can be fishing illegally here and cross to the other country. So the full traceability from MDA, we can now see where they're going. But unfortunately, the NGOs, they are only NGOs. They are not state. So it's better to work on the capability capacity of the states. The NGOs, they have their own agenda. That's true. And the MDA also should break the barrier of interoperability between, amongst them because there are many of them working, but sometimes they, have, they don't have this interoperability. And NGOs and MDA should provide competition because in the same country, you can have two systems that are not interoperating amongst themselves. Thank you very much. Thank you, Captain Maduma. And I understand that the Gulf of Guinea is uh, surrounded by uh, so many countries and must be uh, very complex to promote uh, uh, marine surveillance and management. Uh, thank you for sharing your experience. Now I'd like to turn to Dr. Manumatabi Tupu Rusen, DG of the Pacific Island Forum Fishery Agency. She has been supporting fishery management and development on the tuna and also giving advice to the 17 main countries of the forum. Uh, Manu, please take the floor. Thank you, Mr. Kabuyashi, your excellencies and distinguished delegates. 
I'm humbled to join my esteemed co-panelists to address this eminent forum. Thank you for this opportunity. The Prime Minister of Samoa, Honorable Fiamme Naomi Mata'afa, recently stated, a healthy ocean is essential to all life on Earth and is core to our Pacific way of life. Her words succinctly capture just how critical the ocean is to all of us. It covers 96% of our Pacific region, so it is central to our lives. Indeed, it is our lifeline. And it is this reality that frames our relationship with our ocean. Our ancestors were skilled navigators who worked together to traverse vast areas of ocean in canoes, discovering our island homes and amongst other things to trade with each other. This is our heritage, a heritage of courage, resilience and cooperation. Our forum leader's visionary decision to cooperate to protect our ocean's resources and establish the Pacific Islands Forum Fisheries Agency, the FFA, in 1979 was exceptional. It's our Pacific story of cooperation that I would like to share with you today. Cooperation that is driven towards a safe and secure ocean characterized by sustainable fisheries. And we are determined to continue this vision of our voyages that continue today. FFA has a specific role to ensure the highest levels of social and economic benefits for all of our people from the sustainable use of our fisheries resources. So our people are at the heart of what we do. As Professor Epeli Haofa aptly stated, we should not be defined in the smallness of our islands but in the greatness of our oceans. Our members are collectively responsible for over 30 million square kilometers of ocean and over 20% of the world's exclusive economic zones. As large ocean island states, the Pacific is home to the largest tuna stocks in the world and a third of the world's tuna supply comes from our FFA members' waters, in particular from the waters of a sub-regional grouping amongst our membership known as the Parties to the Nauru Agreement, the PNA. Each year, our members receive over 550 million US dollars in government revenue from access fees and also over 900 million US dollars of tuna is exported from our member countries. But it is never just about the money. It is always about our people. Ensuring that our fisheries revenue contributes to vital infrastructure, such as schools, hospitals, roads, providing food security, employment, protecting our fisheries observers, ensuring that vessel crew have improved conditions on fishing vessels. The Pacific is also home to the only place in the world where the largest and major tuna stocks are biologically healthy. And this is something that we're not complacent with. It highlights even more how important it is to address the challenge of IUU fishing illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing, because the stakes are always so high, from a national, sub-regional, regional, and global perspective.
Some of you will have heard today at our side event about the integrated suite of tools for monitoring, control, and surveillance to combat IUU fishing that have been developed by our members for more than 40 years to, and, and has been significant, as has been referred to by some of my co-panelists, and comes down to partnerships because no one succeeds alone, and we recognize this at FFA. There's a number of partners that we work with, including the Pacific Quadrilateral Defense Partners, Australia, New Zealand, the United States, and France. We also recognize at this juncture the significant contribution from our own member countries, from New Zealand, from Australia, especially from Australia through the Pacific Maritime Security Program, the provision of aerial surveillance coordinated by FFA, the provision of patrol boats to our Pacific members. Distinguished delegates, our ancestors voyaged to new lands. Let us honor them by embracing new levels of cooperation to protect our oceans. As our Pacific Forum leaders stated, the Blue Pacific is our endowment fund. Inherited from our ancestors, which we share with future generations, we must care for, invest in, and nurture the ocean to continue to benefit from it. These words are a powerful reminder to all of us of why we do what we do and why we must work together. As has been coined by our host, President Whips Jr., our oceans, our people, our prosperity. Malo apito. Thank you, Manu, for highlighting the regional cooperations that the FFA has spearheaded in the Pacific regions. May I now turn to uh, the Honorable uh, John Silk, Minister of Natural Resources and Commerce, the Republic of Marshall Islands. Please, uh, Minister, take the floor. Thank you, uh, Mr. Kobayashi. Uh, let me start off by echoing uh, Dr. Manu's uh, 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 opening remarks. She mentioned that her, her country of uh, Tonga, they're skilled navigators, just like we in the Marshall Islands. For generations, we have sailed from one island to the next using traditional navigational skills. And we are known in the world uh, as skilled sailors and navigators. And for centuries, we have navigated ourselves between islands, bringing people and carvers between ourselves and able to go out and fish and bring fish to nourish our people. Now, we are at a stage where we need everybody to help us navigate our waters because at this stage, there are other people who are navigating our waters and reaping the benefits without uh, helping us and without caring about how to protect and preserve the fish that is our livelihood. The Marshall Islands, as you look at the, the slide here, it just dotted small islands in a vast ocean. This is how the Marshall Islands look. This is, this is it, the rest of the Marshall Islands look like this. Very small islands, barely above sea level, and just sand and brush and reef. And we have been called small islands, but actually in the Pacific we call ourselves large ocean states, like Manu said. For the Marshall Islands, our land area is only 180 square 
kilometers. But our exclusive economic zone is almost 2 million square kilometers, which is about the size of Mexico. So you could imagine how we could patrol and protect our resources with the miracle resources, mean resources that we have at our disposal. And as it is within the EZ zone, we have oversight rights to manage the fish stocks within those waters. Fisheries are a vital part to our economy and has been mentioned by Dr. Our, to our well-being and to our identity as a large ocean state. But these fisheries are not just important to the Marshall Islands. They are an essential source of food for the world. Over half of the world's tuna catch comes from the Western and Central Pacific. Thankfully, our stocks are in a healthy state, unlike in many regions of the world. For tuna, a highly migratory species, effective management requires cooperation. Cooperation is central to our biggest success story, the Persian Vessel Day Scheme of eight parties to the Nauru Agreement, our PNA, and Tagalog, has been the core of our success in generating wealth from our fisheries while maintaining catches at sustainable rates. Despite the success, we have seen in our region many challenges that lie ahead, including, one, ensuring that the management of our fisheries is based on science and that we adopt effective harvest strategies for key stocks, minimizing the impacts of climate change on tuna stocks and our inshore marine ecosystem. Of course, we could much prefer that we would, the world took strong actions to avoid serious climate change in the first place. And monitoring our fisheries over our vast ocean space, which is challenging for even the most well-resourced coastal state. Our region has strong monitoring control and surveillance mechanisms. And we know from the latest study commissioned by the FFA that illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing is very low, much lower than we previously thought. But again, cooperation is key. The FFA Regional Fisheries Surveillance Center has officers from several FFA members and conduct operations supported by patrol vessels and aircraft of our quad partners, as mentioned. The Marshall Islands as a large ocean state also recognize that new technologies can help us manage our fisheries more effectively for the future of our children and for the world. Global Fishing Watch will provide analysis to help us identify risk and we'll train Mim MIMRA staff to do that. As I mentioned, new technologies. We have signed an MOU with Global Fishing Watch, which is a nonprofit organization that will help us gather data and help us in the surveillance of our fisheries. But like when I started, I started with our being navigators in our own islands, in between our islands. Now we're asking all of us to help us navigate these waters that have been, that have been our source of food and nourishment and identity and culture for all these years. Thank you. Thank you, Minister Silk, for highlighting uh, your 
efforts uh, to monitor uh, your ocean, and also I congratulate you in successfully uh, curtailing the IUU fishing, and I see still the continuous need for international partnership. I have now pleasure to introduce uh, Mr. David Wilima, Research Officer, Institute for Security Studies in South Africa, but he's originally from Zambia. And yes. we are also happy to say that uh, we have sponsored him and uh, 15 other students to attend our ocean conference. Sessica Peace Foundation is uh, very pleased to be a sponsor for your participation. Uh, David, please take the floor. Your Excellences, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, Ali, and thank you for the opportunity to be able to speak to you today. 25 years ago, uh, speaking at the fifth session of the International Commission on the Oceans in Cape Town, South Africa, President Nelson Mandela said, our future as human beings depends on the intelligent and prudent use of our oceans. And this in turn would depend on the dedicated efforts of men and women from across the world. And this conference for me heeds such a call. And so today I stand here speaking on the nexus between, or rather the interface between maritime security and the blue economy and the role that the youth play in it from an African perspective. So this image that I have put here is a nice matrix by a scholar called Christian Boerger uh, that shows maritime security on the other side and uh, blue economy and the threats that arise um, and so from, from here, what, what I would like to point out is that maritime security and blue economy um, are basically are two sides of the same coin. Maritime security in a lot of ways enables sustainable blue economies because it, 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 it takes away the threats that, that arise um, in the blue economy uh, area. And then if you have sustainable blue economies, you in turn, at the same time, um, deal away with those threats. And so, and you prevent the conditions that give rise to those threats, right? And um, just for context, this is uh, the maritime African domain, which as we might all be aware, Africa is, consists of 55 independent states. But if you look at it geographically, it sits as a large island uh, between the Pacific and the Indian Oceans. And it has over 13,000 square kilometers of maritime zones. And its fishing industry alone uh, provides food and nutritional security to more than 200 million people. And um, it is very important um, that IUU fishing has been a common feature throughout the presentations that we, we're noticing today. Um, but I want to point out a concept called sea blindness that we have when we think about blue economies and the maritime domain from an African perspective. And that is just the the lack of awareness on the potential that the blue economy holds and not only um, advancing economic growth, but also dealing away with some of the development challenges that we have uh, and issues such as poverty and unemployment in the context of a growing youth um, population. Africa is the has the largest population of youth in the world. And by 2030, 42% of the world youth population would be from Africa. Um, and just to add on to that, by 2050, the population of Africa in general would have doubled from what it is now. We're standing at about 1.3 billion. It would be way over um, just above 2.3 billion or so by 2050. And what you see now is a uh, migration that is occurring going towards coastal areas. And if you have a growing youth population and the challenge of unemployment that, that we already see now, it is important that our policies look towards the future. And like I mentioned, we have sea blindness already, but having done this work myself for quite some time now, um, when you analyze the frameworks that guide maritime security and blue economies, they are essentially youth blind. 
you will find that there's little to no mention of the youth and this is um, a challenge that we have. And so I'm so glad today that we have um, decision makers in the room to hear some of these issues. Um, but more so, and when we speak about youth inclusion, um, if, if, if you heard this morning the pledge that the youth cohort that I'm part of this year, we want to, I sometimes struggle with the word inclusion because it, it, it's more of a tokenized thing, like you're just adding numbers. And so we want to go beyond that and that's why we're speaking of an inter intersectional approach to this. And, and just a point, to that, the maritime sector is a very gendered sector. If you look at the stage today, look at the panel, um, that is a very accurate depiction of what happens. Only 2% of seafarers in the world are women. And that is something that we need to address. And so this beautiful picture here is of um, somebody from Africa, Captain Londin Gobo. She is a sh global ship navigator and uh, Africa's first dredge master. And um, I feel like we really need to use an intersectional approach to youth inclusion in the maritime domain. And um, I also want to point out the fact that the world needs to look at Africa differently. And we as Africans need to look at the world differently. You have this notion of um, Africa, the dark continent, but this image here uh, points to the contrary. As you might be aware, 90% of global communications, I have family back home watching me now, and this is because of data optic cables that go through our oceans, right? And 71 of the major um, undersea data cables surround the continent of Africa. So this is an opportunity, an avenue that we need to invest in going forward. And so our relationship with the world will change drastically because of this and, and issues such as shipping um, and, and uh, as we combine efforts to combat issues such as piracy and IUU fishing. Um, and on that note, I would just like to challenge everyone to continue raising awareness on, on, on the issues that we're speaking of today if we are to truly protect our oceans. Salang. Thank you, David, and uh, also linking this uh, blue economy and the maritime security and highlighting the importance of involving the youth. We have now listened to all the five panelists and uh, looking around this Pacific and Africa. May I turn to uh, Rear Admiral Sibley? Um, I'm sure that this uh, pandemic have really affected these operations of the uh, maritime surveillance. And I just wondered if you can tell us a bit more based on your experiences of Oceania bilateral law enforcement agreement in actions. What are really the lessons and the strategies for the future? Yeah, thank you. Uh, you know, the global pandemic affected all of us, and it, it really affected this region as, as much of these small uh, Pacific Island countries uh, shut down their borders uh, to, uh, to keep COVID under control. But we kept operating, and, and through partnerships, uh, we worked, uh, you know, internally in the, within the United States with our federal, state, local, and, and tribal partners, as well as with the, uh, our local partnerships out here throughout the region to really dig into how do we share information better. You know, in the past, we had done a lot of it on, uh, you know, person to person, that human contact that we really thrive on in this region. But we had to get different. We had to get innovative. And we had to use uh, different information sharing to, uh, abilities so that we could, if we were patrolling uh, in a nation's EEZ and we could not uh, bring a ship rider on board because of the pandemic, how could we at least provide some of that maritime domain awareness so that that nation understood what was going on in their waters uh, and, and that the people that were fishing there were, were allowed to be in there? Uh, along with that, it, uh, it also, we had to build a level of trust. And I, and I think, uh, you know, our previous interactions with many of the nations allowed us to, to have some form of level of trust that we had already built. And, uh, and that provided us the ability to be adaptable as, uh, as we went forward. So we really, uh, really worked hard on that. And, and now that we've gotten through it, we've, we've worked out through a lot of those issues. We've learned about how we can safely do 
uh, conduct underway boardings. And after two years, we just completed our first ship rider uh, engagement down in Fiji a couple of weeks ago. We brought uh, three uh, Fijian uh, ship riders on board, inc including the first uh, female ship rider uh, from Fiji on board the Coast Guard Cutter Stratton and conducted eight boardings down in their EEZ, finding uh, you know, a number of violations, but also provided them significant awareness of what's going on. And we really look forward to taking those lessons learned as we move forward. So thank you. Thank you, Admiral Sibley. And uh, can I invite now the Captain Muduma? Um, I see this uh, elimination IUU fishing is uh, one of the must policy target. What is your, uh, this uh, zero tolerance policies uh, for IUU fishing? Can you tell us your visions, how we can implement this uh, tolerance zero of IUU fishing? Thank you, sir. Yesterday, I was afraid when I listened to Mr. John Kerry and the president saying that we have to go to complacency zero and tolerance zero. Tolerance zero in terms of IAU means to criminalize the illegal fishing at sea. And since I know that our world is a world of balance, we need to balance things. And the lack of food can quickly lead us to disorder because, as I said, our first enemy on the earth is our belly. So I think to achieve the zero tolerance, we need to put in place some mechanism with deadlines. For my conception, the first, the first uh, proposal should be to think about how to right size the fishing fleets throughout the world. The second one should be how with the MDA we have now, because 10 years ago, we were not enjoying this kind of data. Now we have the very good data. We need to, to work on the website where we can disseminate the information of the ships, the fishing boat, where they have been fishing, where this product has been landing, the country, the final destination of the illegal fish code. We need to know so the country themselves, they can start reprimanding or working as a responsible country toward these bad guys who are living there. Or Either it could be the flag, the flag state or the port state. The third measure, I think, is simultaneously scientists should work now and go on the terrain and to determine the real region, region where we have the nurseries, because some nurseries are not known. Yesterday again, Mr. Jokey said it was, it, it, we don't see anymore the big tuna we had in the Atlantic Ocean. I wanted to tell him they were caught in Gabon, for example, <laughs> just because. The overfishing is still taking place there. The other one is how to launch an alternative aquaculture as an alternative because taking strong measures. And the, the fifth one is the win-win concept. Before that, I think countries should sign a kind of agreement I, I call the preservation, exploitation, and production sharing contract for fishing products to achieve the concept of sharing prosperity. And the sixth one will be to vote a multilateral agreement criminalizing the illegal fishing by using MDA data as evidence for prosecution of at a global level. Because now we have enough means to do what we should do. We have started since 2008 in Africa, and the conference here took place in 2014. Now the official said we need to go to tolerance zero. So the strategies and Decision making make, makers should now think on how to reach the point of tolerance zero, as they said yesterday. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you Captain Maduma. And uh, now I would like to turn to uh, Minister Silk. I see the application of this uh, satellite uh, uh, monitoring data is uh, vital, and this uh, AIS and BMS. I see your strategies for effectively using uh, AIS and BMS in eliminating IU fishing. Can you comment quickly on how you plan to use satellite data for eliminating IU fishing? Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> the users will be able to see the tracks of fishing vessels. Okay. We will allow basically the public to access uh, these data. And uh, and they'll be able to see, uh, and, and like, I, like I said, the users will be able to see the tracks of fishing vessels that are transiting our waters. 
the VMS includes an all offshore fishing vessels flying the Marshall Islands flag and foreign vessels authorized to fish in our waters. Certain information, such as special identification, may be redacted if we wish to do so, but the MOU that we have with the, uh, that we have just signed provides for the public publication of vessel identification information. And if we choose to retract any of that information, our fisheries managers can still see that data in, in a private workspace. VNS data on the Global Fishing Watch website is delayed by 72 hours, so it is near real time, but not live. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Minister Seuk. And can I just invite uh, David to quickly comment on the role of small island African states in ensuring maritime security and the blue economy? Thank you. Um, a week before I came here, I had the privilege of traveling to Seychelles on a research trip um, just to study their blue economy strategies. And they have done a fantastic job. Uh, they have an initiative called the Great Blue War Initiative, um, which is a network of conservation areas connecting 10 states, um, including France, the Nina African, and, and France. And, and this is to accelerate um, getting to the 30% um, that, that came from Glasgow. And I think such initiatives are great and they also provide avenues for the youth to get involved and to have a sense of ownership and responsibility so that um, there's a continuity that happens there. In terms of maritime security as well, because what happens is uh, land-based um, issues tend to take priority in institutions such as the African Union. So they formed um, what they call the Indian Ocean Commission, which is a coalition of um, five or six island, small island states in the Indian Ocean to address maritime security and they have a regional coordination center. And I think such initiatives are amazing because like has been said here, no one country has the capacity to deal with maritime uh, threats alone and fish move. Uh, and so you, you need to coordinate and share information. So in that regard, I think uh, small island states are doing amazing work and we can learn from them. Thank you, David. And then Manu from Global and Regional Viewpoint. Climate change is obviously a great threat and it may be already affecting this tuna fish catch uh, at the present and the future. What do you uh, plan to address this uh, nexus of climate change and the sustainability fisheries uh, in the regions? Thank you, Mr. Kaboyashi. Our leaders have stated that climate change is the single greatest threat to the security and well-being of our Pacific peoples. There's no greater priority. And as already stated by Honorable Minister Silk, cooperation is central. And so it will require the partnerships of all and the innovative thinking on how we, ad we tackle this challenge together, ensuring that there's climate financing mechanisms that are flexible enough and easily accessible by our island developing countries who are the least contributors to this challenge and a challenge also and a call to action for the greatest polluter, polluting countries to reduce carbon emissions. Tuna fisheries is critical as uh, has been highlighted already, especially from a national level by Honorable Silk. It impacts our economies, our livelihoods, our people, our food security, our whole lifeline as has been highlighted. What the science is telling us is that most notably after 2050, that we will start to see those impacts in terms of abundance and distribution of tunas. So for the countries to the west, there's a huge worry because the science is telling us there'll be an eastwards shift, especially for the skipjack fishery. There'll be impacts on our, on our national licensing revenues of up to 20% by 2050. So it's a huge concern for us in the Pacific, very much about, about our security and about our people. We, we also, I uh, would like to highlight here a really important decision that was taken by our Pacific Forum leaders last year in adopting a normative declaration. And this visionary instrument is to preserve our maritime boundaries, very much about recognition and securing those boundaries in the first instance, 
given sea level rise is already happening. And calling to other partner countries to stand behind that declaration, and especially to our like-minded coastal states around the world. Also making sure that laws, policies, plans support those types of positions on maritime boundaries. And that they have the flexibility to ensure we can adapt to the impacts of climate change in terms of the fisheries management regimes that we put in place. Making sure that regional fisheries management organizations step up and have a greater role in this uh, climate ambition. And speaking also from a large ocean coastal state, a developing state, ensuring that those countries that are most adversely impacted, and we know it's happening, and we know it will continue to happen, the challenge will just get bigger and bigger. Ensuring that knowing those devastating losses, that climate uh, financing compensation is provided uh, to those countries. Thank you. Thank you, Manu. I think uh, our discussions really highlighted the importance of having uh, effective management and law enforcement for sustainable ocean management and uh, our ocean that is our global commons that we really have to work together to ensure that the laws are properly enforced and compliance compli complied. And uh, I really see that they really, it's really a tough work. And I'd like to reiterate our tribute to all of you uh, for your valuable and hard and important work for ensuring our ocean will be safe, um, just, and uh, secured uh, for our uh, generations and the future. Thank you very much. And with this, I'd like to uh, wrap up our sessions on ensuring a safe, just, and secure ocean. Thank you very much.